So now it's time to talk about the extinction of the dinosaurs. And you all know that ultimately the end of all of the large land-going dinosaurs happens at the end of the Cretaceous. But dinosaurs suffered another earlier mass extinction and kind of went through. They kind of lost a lot of members and then evolved into new things and improved, actually. But let's look at the Mesozoic itself. It is bookended by mass extinctions. So the end of the Permian, end of the Paleozoic, largest mass extinction ever, and that really clears the way for dinosaurs to evolve. You remember that they originate sometime in the middle or late Triassic, but then at the end of the Triassic, there's another mass extinction. But then the big one happens at the end of the Cretaceous. Now one thing to note is that that middle geologic period, the Jurassic, it begins and it ends with no different mass extinction whatsoever. So for this class, we're going to worry mostly about the um, end Cretaceous, but I want to talk a little bit about the end of the Triassic as well. And right off the bat, I need to say that they have different hypothesized causes. First of all, the end of the Triassic mostly affects ocean environments, and since dinosaurs don't live there, uh, it's not particularly terrible for them, although several of them, or quite a few actually, do go extinct. But uh, this, this end Triassic mass extinction, what's it associated with? It is associated with a huge period of volcanism, volcanoes, and then all the, rec the sort of follow-on atmospheric oceanic effects. We call it the CAMP hypothesis, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province hypothesis. And all that is saying is that it is recognizing that the opening of the Atlantic Ocean created a lot of volcanic activity. And then it split and the uh, Atlantic Ocean got wider and wider. And so there's evidence of this camp, these volcanic rocks, as you see in the map here, both on the um, eastern side of the Atlantic here in Europe and in Africa, and on the western side of the Atlantic here in the United States, uh, Central America, and South America. All right, let's forget about camp now for this and move on to the end of the Cretaceous. And right away, I want to let you know that size matters. So one thing we're going to see is that all of these large dinosaurs uh, in the lower part, and you see here we also have a small dinosaur and a human and an elephant for scale, but all of these other ones, these are groups we've talked about, they go extinct. They go extinct um, principally because they are large. Uh, being large during a mass extinction means you simply have a larger bullseye on you and you are far more likely to go extinct. So the small little things that lived in and among the feet of the dinosaurs are little mammals like this, little sort of rat, mice, shrew, squirrel type things. They survive. This is reflected as well in the oceans where these little critters called forams below the mass extinction. So if you imagine this as sort of rocks and here's the timeline, uh, the picture in the lower part are of these little um, microscopic critters in the ocean, but they're large. Um, and then after the mass extinction, they come back uh, as different species and they're much smaller. So small things here survive, the big things go extinct. To talk about the end of the Cretaceous mass extinction, we have to go to these guys here, Louis and Walter Alvarez, father and son, and they looked at rocks that contain not dinosaurs, but these forams in Italy. And one of the things they began to work on and say is, well, we know a mass extinction happened here, and in this picture it's right where Walter, the younger son, has his hand laying. Uh, things die. They die on land, they die in the oceans, um, and then above it we have different animals there. How do we tell what is the actual boundary here, or what perhaps caused it? And they went out and they measured the chemistry of the rocks, every possible chemical element they could imagine. And one particular one stood out as something that was unusual. The element iridium, it's rare on Earth, very rare. 
But it's abundant in space, and one of the things they found is that if you go upward in the rocks, and so that's what this the vertical scale is, you know, you have very little iridium, very little iridium, very little iridium, and then it goes off the chart. And you create what we called a spike graph. See how it has a spike shape? What it means is that it's business as usual, not much iridium, and then boom, something dumped a lot of iridium on planet Earth. And they reasoned, okay, this probably then came from space. So we probably had some space object, an asteroid hit planet Earth, dump and deliver this iridium everywhere. And then it, after it settled down, we went back to the normal situation up here. They went to what we call KT, or end of the Cretaceous, start of the tertiary boundary, around the globe. And everywhere they went, even though the rocks look different, here's a land section, here's an ocean core, uh, you had the same pattern. You had larger species below. You had some boundary area with some clay that contained all of that iridium. And then above it, you went back to normal. Now, when they first did it in the 1980s, they found that, look, look, they have about 12, 10 to 12 different spots. Everywhere you see a dot on this map, that's where they had data for this end of the Cretaceous, first part of the tertiary. And everywhere they went, they got that same pattern, the spike. And so it tells you that this is a global pattern, and whatever it was that delivered this iridium had to have a global effect. And that's why they kind of lean towards an asteroid impact. Fast forward a decade later, and now you see we found, everywhere you see a dot, iridium has been found at that boundary. You see there are a lot more sites. And we also have different measurements of the abundance here. Iridium tends to be everywhere. So this, this data has been duplicated all over the place. If you try to model how an asteroid hitting the Earth would uh, affect the Earth and the atmosphere, you, you can create a model like this. You have an object hitting the Earth. There is an explosion. The heat from the explosion and the friction is so great that it literally will melt many, many, many tons of rock, and then it gets thrown back up into the atmosphere. And so all of this debris that's thrown up here is thrown into the atmosphere where it's going to be circling the Earth with um, um, prevailing winds, and that would be how this iridium could be um, delivered everywhere. Uh, shortly after the break, it starts settling. You have a large crater as a result. And then you have this settling of this debris, this melted debris. So not just iridium, but these can be actual sort of particles settling all over the Earth at that particular time. What would be one of the effects? If you look at this, now the lower scale, the, the x-axis is uh, time. And so here, boom, there's the impact. And then if you look at hours afterwards, days afterwards, week after, you see, this is sort of time going by, and this is temperature. If you imagine that this, this horizontal line is normal temperature, right at the impact, because that's a huge explosion, temperatures go off the charts. You're going to have intense heat, intense explosive activity, a fireball, in other words. That's going to decline after a few hours to a few days to perhaps a few weeks. But so much junk is going to be thrown up into the atmosphere that it's going to reflect the sun away rather than allowing it to penetrate to the Earth. And so temperatures then are going to drop. And then that, that effect is from weeks to months to years. But because so much of this explosive activity also released carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that turns up the heat by creating an intense greenhouse effect. So over this short period of just a few decades, you go from extreme heat to extreme cold back to extreme heat again. And this, this time scale, this is too fast for most organisms to uh, evolve uh, to deal with. And that's why this uh, could have caused uh, death and ultimately extinction at many different levels over a very short period of time.
Well, let's look at some of the evidence again. And here we have these little things called tektites. And you can think of these as micrometeorites. Think of all that melted rock debris that was thrown up into the atmosphere. It cools, it hardens, it turns into these little teeny tiny balls, and they, brrr, they rain down all over the Earth right at that time period. And yes, we find these KT, uh, right at this KT boundary, we find billions upon billions of these tektites. Soot. I mentioned the fireball. The fireball would ignite huge fires covering probably hundreds of thousands of square miles, um, producing lots of soot, which would ultimately then rain down as well. And again, we find a soot spike as well. So if you look at something like this here, you see that we've got um, a spike in the um, It's kind of offset here, but it's kind of you see a spike in both the iridium and the soot. So very, very interesting. A final bit of evidence came from what's called shocked quartz. Now you're looking at a picture of a single sand grain under a microscope. So this whole thing might be a millimeter across. And normally you would just look at it and see the pretty colors, but you see these prominent sort of lines, these parallel lines going up and down, and then you see some going across. Those are shock lines, and quartz is such a hard mineral. The only way to make those shock lines in these sand grains is from extreme, extreme high pressures, like what would happen at boom, an asteroid impact. And once again, we find these things abundant at this KT boundary. So when after this was proposed, shortly after, within a few years, everybody knew that this was the picture of how dinosaurs met their doom. Uh, here they are happily going about their life and then a large object with all thousands and millions perhaps of small objects spalling off of it here all hit the earth causing this um, huge disaster and leaving all these bits of evidence for us. But there was one huge unanswered question and that is where is the crater? Remember, if this happens, there should be a giant hole in the ground. Um, and so we have to search for this. Now think about it. We have a planet with an atmosphere. We have rain, snow, ice, and ocean, running water. We have all these things that could erode it away and remove it. And so after, you know, in 65 million years, that whole thing could be destroyed. But the hope was that they could still find it. And so we went to look at every known impact site around the globe. And um, you may or may not know it, but there are hundreds of these things all around the globe. And here's just a map of where we have a bunch of these things in North America. But uh, none of these were the proper time. They have to be dated at 65 million years old so that they're right there at the end of the Cretaceous, the start of the tertiary. Ultimately, it wasn't found in North America. It was found by Mexican petroleum geologists from the National Petroleum Company there, Pemex, and they discovered this huge grater. Uh, it's not visible at all at the surface of the Earth. It's in the subsurface, um, and it has a huge, huge diameter. You see here the diameter is, is about 30 to 40 kilometers in diameter. And then you've got these outer shock lines over here. I found the, found the crater. The best part is it's dated at exactly the right time. And so we can look at the data um, and the crater from the subsurface data they have. And it suggests to us that the object that made it would have been an asteroid about 10 kilometers in diameter. And just by the shape of the crater, go back to this one here, we can tell what direction the asteroid came from and at what angle it even happened. And so that's what this big arrow is showing across here. Boom! Hits the Earth right here. And one of the first things that's going to happen is it's going to um, also start off a huge, huge tsunamis that would have traveled up and flooded vast portions of North America. But also those other things as well. It's going to 
spread the shocked quartz. It's going to ignite global wildfires to spread this soot. You're going to have these tektites raining down from all over the world. And so really by the mid 80s, the thought was and into like the earliest 90s, the thought was, oh, it's solved. We did it. This giant object hit the earth, boom, destroyed the dinosaurs and a whole bunch of other things. But an alternative hypothesis came up from different researchers. And what they said was, you don't have to invoke some exotic rare thing from outer space hitting planet Earth. We also had a huge, huge um, eruption area that can do the same thing. And one of the bits of important evidence that they came out with was that these giant volcanoes like this, and you see here it's, it's in India and it's a place called the Deccan Traps, it can produce lots and lots of iridium because it turns out iridium, it's rare not on the earth, it's rare on the surface of the earth. In the subsurface, there's plenty of iridium. So if you've got a volcano that's belching out lots and lots of lava and gas and ash and everything, you're going to do a lot of iridium as well. And guess what? These eruptions were so explosive, they also produced the shocked quartz. They would also ignite the wildfires, which would um, set off the, uh, the soot spike, and then the tektites, all of these things. And so they um, started pushing their hypothesis as well. And so you have images like this with dead dinosaurs because of... Look at this large explosive activity in the background. And so the, it became a big issue. Very contentious, very um, bitter fighting among scientists over which hypothesis was correct. The asteroids or the volcanoes. And thankfully, our astronomer friends, our astrophysics friends, began looking outside of planet Earth for us. So if you look at the moon, the moon is covered with craters and they don't tend to disappear because they don't have the atmosphere and the weathering and all of that that um, would destroys craters on planet Earth. And that made people start uh, modeling. Uh, let's get rid of this here. Modeling um, what would happen when asteroids hit a large planetary object. And it turns out that if you do that, imagine, look at the top of the, the globe here. This is supposed to be a model of the Earth boom something hits the earth right here here it's on the north pole but all of these little arrows streaming across here these are shock waves traveling through the earth and notice they travel around they bounce around but then a lot of them concentrate and you have extreme shaking and explosive and earthquake activity on the planet but notice it's exactly 180 degrees away the opposite side of the planet. We call that antipode. The antipode is 180 degrees away on a circle, on a 360 degree circle. So then they looked around the, the uh, solar system and it turns out that Mercury is a pretty good model for antipodal podal volcanism. There's a giant crater. Uh, look, it's over a thousand kilometers in diameter called the Caloris Basin. The outer rim of this thing is huge. It's three kilometers high. And if you go 180 degrees around the planet, um, which is sort of shown here, there's the Caloris Basin. On the other side, there's a large volcanic field. So this would be supportive evidence for this concept of antipodal volcanism. Look at Mars. Mars has this giant crater called the Hellas Planitia. And if you go 180 degrees around there, there is a giant volcanic field called the Alba Patera. And so once again, you've got another solid rock body that has evidence that this, this hypothesis that a large object hitting a planet will cause intense volcanic activity on the other side of the planet has been verified at two of these um, planetary locations. And so, the solution has been that it is both. So an asteroid hits planet Earth here in Mexico, causes what? Everything, shocked quartz, iridium, sp spikes, soot, 
um, intense uh, micrometeorite tectonic airfall. At the same time, the shock waves will travel around the Earth where India is or was. It's not no longer down here, um, but it was back then. And start and create this great Deccan Traps Indian um, volcanism which would then do the same set of effects over here, sort of a one-two killing punch. Very, very bad day, which becomes a horrible hours, weeks, months, years, decades, hundreds of years, centuries, thousands before life comes back. Uh, but again, suffice it to say, this two-fold event happens and we lose all of our large dinosaurs.